Hello, everyone. My name is Ethan Plotzker. I work with The Match Guy. And welcome to our first chapter in our mini-series on ethics for the USMLE. Today, we're going to be discussing informed consent and the most common types of questions that you can expect to see on your USMLE or shelf exams. So the first thing is that informed consent has a very particular definition. It's the process of a provider telling a patient about the risks, benefits, and alternatives to a medical intervention. It's important that the provider gives all three. The patient has to know about what could go wrong, what could go right, and other options that they have in their arsenal of treatments so that the patient can make a decision with all of the knowledge at hand. There's a lot of components of informed consent that you can expect to see on your exam. So discussions of risks, benefits, and alternatives, like I was saying. A lot of times questions might talk about a scenario where a patient is being given um, a speech about the potential treatment options by a provider, but the provider may not mention the alternatives to the procedure or the risks, for instance. And then the question might ask, what did this patient or rather physician fail to do? And in that case, the physician didn't give full informed consent because to have full informed consent, you have to have all three components, risks, benefits, and alternatives. The next is that the patient has to have decision-making capacity. So we'll get to the differences between capacity and competence in a bit, but capacity is the ability for a patient to basically reason through the options they're given and understand what's going on. And that's important for informed consent because a patient can't give informed consent if they don't understand their options. And what a lot of times questions can ask about, what does this patient lack? They might give an example of a patient with altered mental status, for instance, and ask, why could this patient not give informed consent? The next part of informed consent is that the decision that the patient gives remains stable over time. That shows that the patient isn't flip-flopping back and forth. They're not unsure. They are very confident about what they would want to do with their medical care. And that's important to obtain on the provider's end. So a question could ask about that as well. Let's say the patient can't make a choice. And then it says, what should the physician do? In that case, the physician shouldn't move forward with something until the patient has reached a decision where it remains stable over time. The next component is voluntariness. So the patient has to do and want the intervention themselves. They can't be pressured by any family or friends or put any put under any kind of duress. They really have to want this intervention for themselves and questions can ask about that. They can give an example of a patient who maybe their wife or their child or parent is really pushing them into doing a certain intervention, but they don't want it. And then in that case, the question would expect you to understand that and then reason through that and say to the patient something along the lines of, it seems like this isn't what you really want. Let's talk about that further. Next is understanding. So kind of in line with the decision remaining stable over time, the patient has to understand the options they're given and they have to be able to communicate that. So it could be recapitulating what the provider is saying or showing that they can reason through all of the risks, benefits, and alternatives. But overall, it's important that the patient understand their options and questions like to test that as well. The final important part is that communication, or you have to communicate rather, that informed consent can be revoked at any time. Patients have to understand that whatever intervention you're doing, they are always in the driver's seat. And they are always the ones who want it. Or if they want it to stop, they have the final say. You could have a question, for example, of a patient who's undergoing chemotherapy. And then partway through, they want to cease all treatment. As long as they understand the risks, benefits, and alternatives of stopping treatment, and they have capacity, they understand it, etc., they can make the final judgment call, and you would have to stop the chemotherapy. Questions on the USMLE like to test capacity versus competence. So what is the difference? Capacity is determined by a physician, either in the hospital or outpatient setting. And that's different from competence, which is determined in a court of law. 
So let's say you have a question talking about a patient who has altered mental status and can't seem to make up their mind. Would they lack capacity or competence? Well, if the doctor walks in and tries to question them about it and sees that they can't settle on one option, for instance, then they wouldn't have capacity. Competence would have to be by a lawyer and is an entirely different sort of entity. Other parts of capacity that are important is that to understand if a patient has capacity, you should see if a patient can reason through information and express a choice, which again, that's just a routine part of informed consent. And that's needed for informed consent by a physician. While informed consent is really important and very testable, equally as testable are the exceptions to informed consent. So the first is that patient doesn't have decision-making capacity. For some reason, if the patient lacks understanding or isn't doing their statements voluntarily, they don't have informed consent and you should not give them the intervention because they have to have full understanding of the treatments at hand. The next is therapeutic privilege, which basically states that patients, if they would be harmed by knowing their diagnosis or if they would harm others, should not have access to that information. It should be withheld from them because in the end, it's doing what's best for the patient. The next is an emergency situation. So let's say you have a question where you have some sort of trauma incident and then the patient comes in to the ED and they're bleeding, they're unstable, they're tachycardic and an x lap is indicated. Would you want to get informed consent? So in that case, assuming the patient probably is unconscious, you would not need to get informed consent. That's because an x lap or any sort of procedures corresponding to that would be life-saving. And if it's a life-saving procedure in that kind of emergent scenario, then you wouldn't have to obtain informed consent. The final exception, which is more rare on the step exams, is if the patient waves away their desire to inform consent, basically saying, I don't really need to understand anything, just do what you think is best. Therapeutic privilege is high yield because it balances two important parts. So doing what's best for the patient or patient autonomy or acting in the patient's best interest or beneficence. So when you get questions on therapeutic privilege, it's important to balance both and see what is best for the patient. But regardless, you have to understand that if giving the information to the patient would result in a worsening of their condition, maybe they might sp start to spiral, then you wouldn't want to do that. Let's go through some exercises to really hammer these home. A 63-year-old man is hospitalized following a motor vehicle accident in which he sustained serious injuries and blood loss. The trauma surgeon would like to initiate a massive transfusion protocol. Upon further questioning, the patient states he is a Jehovah's Witness and does not want a blood transfusion. He is aware that refusing this treatment might lead to death. What should the physician do? So in this case, we're faced with an example of a patient who is refusing a life-saving option. So let's make sure we have all aspects of informed consent. Does the patient have um, an understanding of the risks? He does. Does he have an understanding of the benefits? He also does. What part of informed consent isn't present though? The alternatives. The physician next should describe other alternatives that the patient might want to follow. Still, that being said, if the patient does not want any kind of intervention and the patient is able to reason through his choice and show he understands it, then his word is law and you would not want to do any sorts of interventions. Next example. A 40-year-old woman with a past medical history of obesity, schizophrenia, alcoholism, and dilated cardiomyopathy is admitted due to an exacerbation of her cardiomyopathy. On interview, the attending physician states he would like to begin the necessary treatments to resolve the exacerbation. The patient adamantly denies all medical interventions, stating she does not want to live anymore. Her breath smells of alcohol and nystagmus is elicited on exam. What should the physician do? So there's a couple of hints in this question. So she has a lot of factors that might make her less likely to 
understand her condition. The schizophrenia, the alcoholism. She currently might be drunk because her breath smells of alcohol. She has the stagmus. She might have some Wernicke Korsakoff. It doesn't seem like she has full capacity to understand what her situation is. In that case, the physician might want to look into other options, whether it's looking for um, a surrogate or a power of attorney or someone else to help make the choice. But regardless, this patient is saying she doesn't want any interventions, but this can't stop there because it's clear that she doesn't understand the gravity of her situation. Next exercise. A 53-year-old male with a history of major depressive disorder is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. The patient's wife is concerned that the patient would harm himself if he were to know about his condition. What should the physician do? So this is a prime example of therapeutic privilege, which is again, where withholding information from the patient should be done in the case where the patient could hurt himself or others. It's possible that this patient with depression might try to commit suicide, for instance, knowing that he has a terminal cancer. So in this case, it might be warranted to withhold the diagnosis from the patient. Exercise four. A patient arrives to the emergency department after experiencing a motor vehicle accident. Upon arrival, he states that he has severe abdominal pain with rebound tenderness and guarding. Before the interview can continue, the patient becomes unconscious. An X lap is indicated. Should the surgeon proceed with this procedure? So as mentioned before, if the patient cannot give informed consent and you have an emergency situation, then yes, you should otherwise go with your treatment because it can be life-saving. There might not be time to reach out to family or friends who could give you a better idea of what the patient would want. Thank you for listening. I hope this was helpful and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions.